Hey, this is Dave Pryor. Welcome to The Reluctant Agilist. I'm doing another video interview with Jim Benson. So, Jim, thank you for taking time out of your hectic morning. It's been a hectic morning, but it is wonderful to be here. This is the calm in the middle of the storm. I, I had the opposite. I had a bunch of stuff scheduled and it all canceled. So I was just like sitting around reading, mm. waiting for this to happen. So then I will try and be your storm. I'm caffeinated up. Um, <laughs> so what we're going to talk about today is something that I've been learning about in the course that I'm taking with Modus Institute. It's called the five lenses, um, which is a way. Well, I don't, actually, I'm not even going to try to do this. Jim, how would you explain the five lenses? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the the course that, that Dave's talking about is the Lean Agile Visual Management Program at, at Modus Institute, and uh, over the course, like ever since we we wrote um, uh, Personal Kanban, um, people have been asking us, "When are you going to have the master class in Personal Kanban?" and the thing about our approach to how we visualize work, how we work with teams, how we work with companies is we want to make sure that the work is humane. The, what we found is that when teams, when groups of individuals come together and form a, an, a really well acting team, they're, they don't just have a Kanban. <laughs> and they're not just doing some rituals in some sort of order, but that they actually have uh, a humane working environment. So I'll just go ahead and share the screen with, with this doc on it. Um, the system of humane management, uh, which, which these are the lenses for, we tend to look at a few things to make sure that the humans in the team are working well together. And when they do that, then that means that they have clarity about their work, the work is flowing nicely, that they have a good continuous improvement um, regimen, uh, that there is psychological safety, that people can act with confidence. And so these are the elements that we think that people need in order to be good professionals, that they can do work where they're proud of. And so the first one is communication. So communication in essence is just are you getting the information that you need when you need it in order to do a good job? Are you giving other people the information they need when they need it in order for them to do a good job? So there's a relationship there uh, of human beings. They're in some sort of loose network and they exchange information back and forth. And that is how the group processes work. So the first thing we want to make sure is that there's good communication because it shows that the group is processing work, that they're not just doling out work to individuals, putting them in their little silo and sending them off to work alone, right? So then the second part of that is relationships. And these are all the relationships. So relationships with your teammates, with your bosses, with your boss's bosses, with your boss's 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 bosses, with customers, uh, with your supply chain, you know, whatever is, is with the relevant. work as well, right? Yeah, and the and the work, yes. Okay. And 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 then there's your relationship to like intangibles, like your relationship to quality, your relationship to fixing defects, your relationship to professionalism. Uh, but there's an understanding there that you are an individual on a team providing value, and that that requires you to do stuff. And you're never doing stuff alone. <laughs> you're always doing it in relationship to something else. So are there areas that you can see when you look at the way that people are working or when they're talking to each other or when they're explaining something where you can say, ah, here is a codependent relationship. Here is a dysfunctional relationship. Here is a, dis here's a, um, a bifurcated relationship. Uh, that there are that you see this all the time. You see these things all the time. And when no one ever goes to fix them because they're too busy trying to do Kanban or trying to do uh, scrum or trying to do something right. else, <laughs> but, but they're not looking at the people and saying, wow, you, you all, you all are messed up. <laughs> uh, so then we say, okay, so if you look at the relationships and you look at what the information are that people need, then you can start to see what the relationship is between those two things. Okay. So there's something that happens. There's some information that's, that's, that's generated. How is that disseminated or hoarded or ignored or flushed down the toilet? Okay. Um, and those things, those things relate to each other. And when you start looking at that, then you start seeing respect. And this is respect for people's professionalism, for their right to exist, 
uh, for, for their respect to be an active professional member of a team. So again, psychological safety doesn't come from just being able to speak up when something's wrong. Psychological safety isn't the whistleblower act. <laughs> okay. Psychological safety is, does the system and the people within that system respect everyone, all of the professionals in that system and their ability to make a judgment? And that judgment can be keep going, slow down, speed up, do this, stop doing that. This is awesome. This sucks, whatever that might be. But our ability to make those judgments, if we make them, people like them and we act on them, they're more likely to do it again. Okay. Respect is a self-perpetuating grease machine <laughs> for, for, how we do, for how we do our work. And so when you have those three things together and you're looking at them in that kind of a practical way, not like huggy, like, oh, sweetie, are you doing okay today? Right. But, but as a professional, are you getting what you need? Then two types of flow happen. So this is the fifth one, the fourth one down here. Uh, flow, there's two types, psychological flow, which is uh, I'm not overburdened by the crushing existential fear of doing my work, <laughs> which almost everyone is. Right. Uh, and, and so when you get into that state where your work is well described, you know what you're supposed to do next. You can act with confidence. You know who to help and when. Then okay. you have a state of psychological flow like Mihai Csikszentmihalyi wrote about in his book, Flow. If you haven't read that book, I would suggest that you do that immediately, immediately. <laughs> pause the <laughs> podcast go read the book and then come back um the second type of flow obviously is workflow so have you set up a process or a set of processes that that logically and predictably complete the work that you have at hand and that isn't to say that all work is going to be easily completable but even if you run into complexity into complex work do you have a set of systems to ingest that complex work. Because what happens now is everybody assumes that their work is like totally understandable and nice. And then when something complex comes up, they fool themselves and they say, it's not there, it's not there, it's not, it's, it's everything's fine. And I'm gonna give this to Dave Pryor. And then Dave Pryor is gonna screw it up. And then I'm going to call him into the office and I'm going to harangue him for not doing something right when we, had, we didn't have a system set up to right. ingest that work. Okay. The last one is uh, PDSA or continuous improvement, plan, do, study, adjust. Um, I find that in, in lean, when we come in as a lean consultant and work with people, we lead with PDSA and there is zero systems available to be able to actually support PDSA. And huh. A3s, Kanban's, uh, fishbone diagrams, et cetera. Those things are awesome, absolutely necessary, completely crucial tools yeah. that will not let you do PDSA because PDSA is a social construct. Okay. You have to be able to have the information that you need, working with people that you know you can work with in a system that is rewarding you to make professional judgments and allow work to flow before you can do continuous improvement. Because if, you're, because if you don't have that, it will never be safe for you to say, hey, this thing doesn't work right. right. And continuous improvement is all about taking things that don't work right and calmly and professionally making them work right, as opposed to freaking out and finding out who's accountable and so on and so forth. So <laughs> communications, relationships, respect, flow, and continuous improvement, that's how we use it. All right. I believe while that was very long, that's the fastest I've ever been able to ex explain those. <laughs> and I, I, I want to appreciate myself for not interrupting you because I really wanted to so many times. Um, now I'm going to ask a whole bunch of questions and I'm going to. Now you're going to interrupt me. Yes. <laughs> post, post, I, post, I, they're all kind of spun up, ready to go. So post rental interrupt us. Yeah. When, uh, when I ask these questions, the first thing I want to try to explain to everybody is I've been in this program for a year and I've been learning about these things. So a lot of what I'm going to ask about now is rooted in that. Um, and the first thing that I, I wanted to try to see if you can comment on, when you use the word you made and you use communication, you talk about relationships and you talk about respect, my 
or even just saying people as professionals. Mm -hmm. My understanding of those terms and the value, the weight that they carry, like what they mean to me now is very different than it was when I started the program. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think maybe the simplest example that I can give is respect coming into this program meant like don't interrupt somebody who's higher than you on the in the org chart like show them let them talk you shut up and listen um but now respect is is a much deeper thing to me where when i think about respecting other people it's not just not interrupting them but trying to to provide them with a system that will enable them to thrive and do Mm -hmm. amazing things and it's almost like honor is a better word for me than respect um but I just I want to see if you if you can comment on kind of that and how these things tie together and the way that you look at creating this humane system. Mm. So um, words are um, a virus. It's like, yes, language is a virus. That's just, that's what your neighbor Laurie Anderson would say. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, um, you know, the, the other day I was giving a talk, uh, about, uh, com- uh, complexity and collaboration. And one of the questions came up, like, is it, is it collaboration or is it cooperation or is it this, or is it that, or is it the other thing? And, and it's important to examine words and, and to, to dive deep into them, um, the other thing that's beautiful about words is that they can be poetry. <laughs> so they can be woven together in, in a variety of ways. And so uh, what I would say is that at the moment, there is a, there's a certain vocabulary, there's a certain coherence to the way I've strung these words together that does not preclude other, other definitions. So one of the, um, one of the things that uh, we fought about about this piece of paper that we're looking at right now, this virtual one, is the word "the." So I try whenever I come up with a list of things to not include the word "the." Okay, why? <laughs> because there can be because, uh, and you'll find this out later on, <laughs> and this might be a, a bit of a, 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 a spoiler alert for people who haven't taken the class yet. But one of the uh, exercises in this is to say to say. What's your sixth lens? This isn't, this isn't, a, this is a coherent system, but it yeah. isn't, this isn't a fully, I haven't, I haven't invented the cold fusion of, of humane management. <laughs> right. so, so the, 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 so the thing about, about respect as a word for me and, and why it was selected here was because so many times I've entered, or Tony and I have worked with teams that are not just disrespected, but abused, like just outright abused. And a lot of them have built the systems by which they are abused. So it's not like they have evil CEO that, you know, just comes in and, you know, Tesla's all over them, right. uh, but 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 um, but we we will do things like teams that know nothing about each other, nothing about the work they're doing. They will come in and they'll say, "Let's do Scrum," and then they will build an abusive system because they don't naturally work in a Scrum way, right? And the work doesn't require a Scrum way, and so they they've now forced some false. Uh, process on the work that they're doing and it makes them miserable it increases their defects it you know decreases their communication with other people regardless of the rhetoric of the system it can be yeah. kanban it can be personal kanban you know it can be anything um so we want to make sure that that a notion of respect is that we always have something to offer other people mm-hmm. and we know they always have something to offer us and that that is important when you're individuals on a team trying to create value, because if you don't feel that way, then you're going to do the things that we see software development teams do all the time. Like they have horrible things like a product owner 
and that product owner does nothing but own the product. And they'll write all of the user stories and they'll write, they'll do all of the planning. And then the team has no context about the work that they're doing. And then on the team, you've got these developers that say, I only develop, I don't test. And then you have these testers and, and now we have like DevOps teams, which just shows how pathological we are about building teams and not about understanding even things like DevOps, which was a whole book saying, don't build teams. Look at the work. <laughs> but so but in those models, people work. want the role to play. They want the boundaries because it makes them feel like they know what their gig is, right? Because they don't trust the system to protect them. Yeah, because because that's exactly it. Because they haven't. So role definition is a huge part of this. So role definition is something that gives us clarity so that we know what and how what we can do to help and when we can help and how we can help. Uh, that's super important, but we all know because we all had jobs that from day to day, different things are required by the work than necessarily fit into our neat job descriptions. Okay. And so we want to be able to have areas of expertise and we want to have the respect of our teammates to say things like on our group, in our group, Jim is the database expert. So if you have any database questions, you should include Jim in the conversation, if not ask, Right. Um, that there's that type of respect. So there's a respect for the, um, the individuality of the professionals that are on the team. Okay. But there's also the respect for the work. So if the work shows up and the work requires three people from your team and three people from another team and two people from a third team, are you really going to call that a dependency and do your work here, not talking to the other people and then send it over? Because that sounds pretty crazy to me, but that's what just about everybody does. Because that's what they were taught to do. It's because that's what their team makes them do. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and, your and team if, is sacrosanct. But if they are respecting one another and their relationship to each other in the work, then they'll find a better way to to work together as one, right? The, the product yes, owner do, will do, do crazy. Make sure they understand the vision and the background and everything behind it, and give the team whatever they need and work with them instead of just throwing stories at them. Yeah, you'll you'll do crazy things like get out of your chair and go sit in another chair with the people that you actually need to work with. You'll recognize that this particular piece of work requires a team that your arbitrary structure doesn't currently support. Okay. (laughs) The thing about this stuff is it makes sense when you say it out loud, but most people, or at least me, maybe Uh not most people, I had never thought about stuff to that, that level. Like the whole thing about respect, you know, you mentioned inviting the database person to the meeting, the section in the course where we learn about respecting people's time and like not inviting people that don't need to be there. Mm -hmm. Um, That has gotten me on this whole twist where if I'm in a meeting now and somebody shows up at the meeting and they're, they have to give some kind of update and they're like, well, uh, it's Tuesday. uh, I ate breakfast today Mm -hmm. and I'm wearing (laughs) pants. And to me, that is a sign of, I'm now taking it as a sign of hostility, like maybe unintentional, but they just couldn't be bothered. And that means that everyone who's there is a prisoner of them not being prepared. Mm-hmm. And, and that is that is part of respect. And it's also communication. So it's highly likely that if you have a meeting where somebody comes and needs to update you on something, that you haven't bothered to build a visual control that would have provided that update. With okay. No now, <laughs> all right. So this is different rabbit hole. <laughs> but we were we were on a call and we were talking about scaling this stuff. Mm-hmm. Could an organization create a visual system that would communicate things? Or have you seen? I actually I know the answer to this question. I'm going to ask it and we'll walk right into it. Could the organization <laughs> create a visual system that would allow everybody working on the teams to know at the highest level like what's going on? Yeah. At that strategic level. <laughs> Um, so, uh, the, uh, that, that thing is called an Obeya. Uh, okay. it is a single location where all of the visualizations needed to run a particular project live. Uh, historically they have been in a physical location, but during 
COVID, you know, there are all sorts of great opportunities have come up to do this virtually. Um, but we have managed billion dollar projects, $2 billion projects with a single OBEA uh, that has been used by literally hundreds of different stakeholders. Uh, that isn't a two pizza team. <laughs> <laughs> that that is that's that's like that's like all the pizzas on on the Upper East Side team. Okay. Uh, so uh, the the building at 6600, 66 Hudson that's being built now um, uh, by the Java Center in New York. That's a two billion dollar project. had had a had a beautiful Obeya. The Coney Island Hospital had a beautiful Obeya. And what happens then is that the people who are working every day on the project or pieces of the project, all of their stuff is being updated in the same place at, at the same time. Right. Everyone else is working on the project that isn't part of that. So I'm not part of structural steel or it going in, but I am part of, uh, you know, uh, ornamental metals. And I know that later on, I'm going to need to do something so I can see their visualizations. I know how their work is going. Okay. And I start to learn things. I start to learn things that you wouldn't think about normally. So you look at how is communication happening on the project as a whole. Even, so this even isn't not just active. verbal. It's also, you know, I mean, osmotic communication, just the visual communication, like everything. Yep. Okay. Everything, everything. And so what I've witnessed on these projects, which is like the most important thing, is that owners, stakeholders, designers, people who aren't in that part of the project every day, who used to require very long updates that were unbelievably boring and had 10 page agendas, um, uh, that they used to show up and they would go through that and they were only listening for one thing. What's here that I don't like that I can comment on. Right. <laughs> so those meetings always ended up by design, not intent, but by design. So your intention is not your design. Okay, we should, as software developers, we should all know this. <laughs> our intention is rarely our design. And so by design, those systems end up being adversarial. And then they cost money, they cost time, because instead of solving problems early, you wait for something to complain about. So now when they walk in and they see everything that's happening, they can start asking questions about what's happening. They learn as you're going along the issues that you're running into, the thought processes right. to solve those issues. And then you understand the narrative of the project. And understanding the narrative of the project makes you less cranky <laughs> about things that you would have done differently because yeah. you can see the struggle to get there. Um, okay. they're, they're beautiful, but, but yeah, I mean, this is, these are projects larger than almost every startup in history. But you don't have to be of a massive size to have an obey. I mean, you can have that regardless. Of no, you were talking about scaling. Right. Okay. Thank yeah, you. No, Mod Modus, Modus, <laughs> Modus Institute is eight people okay. and we have an obey that we use every day. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I just want to mention one thing, because this is another thing that I think about with meetings now. If I'm an executive and I have a status meeting with 10 people and each one of them is only giving an update for like 30 seconds during that meeting, all that time that people are sitting there is time that they're not working. I'm stealing that time away. I mean, it's just kind of self-defeating to have that kind of situation. Well, but the other thing is that what, what we do, and I was just, just, just counseling one of my clients about this because they were, they want to, they want to do these, these three week sprint things. And, um, and they said, you know, well, we're going to start off doing this planning session and it's going to start off being an hour, but when we develop the muscle, then it's going to get down to 30 minutes. And I'm like, why are you in such a hurry to do the most important work that you do? <laughs> right. And it's because in lean, they call us value-added work and not value-added work. Uh, and in software development, we call it typing and shit product owners do. <laughs> sure. uh, but, but, the, um, but, but the thing is, is that literally understanding our work is the most important part of our work. The more we understand it, the less we'll type. The less we type, the better coders we are. All right. I want to... Pause for a second. That was a really important phrase. 
<laughs> understanding our work is the most important part of our work. And for me, like that was the whole thing that I, when I started doing personal Kanban, I felt like I became a student of the choices I make and how I make them. Mm-hmm. And that allowed me to gain insights. It continues to provide me with tons of food that helps me figure out each week, like what, why did I do that? What do I need to to do better? Like, how can I make a choice that seems more in line with what I say I want, as opposed to what I feel like I'm obligated to do or whatever reason I'm making Mm -hmm. a choice. And so for an organization that says it wants to get better, that that's the biggest part of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Clarity is the most important gift you can give to any, anyone in any situation. So if they're so, saying they want to be agile, that should include the clarity, but a lot of them are too busy being agile to actually figure out what they're doing. <laughs> so, so, well, yes, but I, I'll say that, you know, whether it's, again, whether it's agile, lean, rep, prince to whatever, whatever process world you're going to subscribe to, what ends up happening is we're like, you know, if I just do the things, then, then everything will be fine. So work is almost always a complex adaptive system. Every one of those words that we just used is a simple, is a simple and singular approach. It, it's not itself a complex adaptive system. So it just, it, it's foolish to think that anyone has ever come up with the one way of working, you know, and as 50% of the human beings on earth that came up with Kanban, <laughs> uh, I, I will say right now that Kanban is not the only way to visualize your work. It is an incredibly important, extremely versatile, useful way to, to, to visualize your work, but I've never seen an effective team only have a Kanban. Okay. And I've seen Kanban teams talk about their Kanban, talk about their Kanban, talk about their Kanban and get a lot more value from this crazy visualization that they built next to it but they don't even know it's, they, 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 there's like some sort of definitional boundaries in their heads where they define their world by the Kanban and they don't see that this is the thing that they did that really gave them the vision. Okay. I love that. <laughs> so we, how, we're so good at joining things and so bad at building things. <laughs> well, if a team is just, they set up a Kanban board there. I mean, my experience has been, whether it's Scrum or Kanban, whatever, they're trying to follow the process. They're trying to go through the motions, get the thing done the way it's supposed mm-hmm. to be done with the promise that like, if I do this stuff, Agile will happen and there will be unicorns and trumpets. Yeah, right. But <laughs> but it will rain bunnies. Yeah. <laughs> but how do I, um, how would they employ these, these five things? Like my, my worry is that a team would say, would listen to this and think, oh yeah, we got to do that. And then every retrospective, instead of mad, sad, glad, you're going to have five boxes <laughs> oh. and they're going to have to put post-its on here for the five boxes. Oh my God. So, so first of all, that is exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> uh, I, I lie awake at night thinking about this. So I'm just about done with the next book, The Collaboration Equation, which goes through and talks about, you know, how can you build a right environment where professionals can do professional work? How can you help people act with confidence and build teams that, that work well? And there's all these different mechanisms in the book to do that. And it, my editor has had to like edit out my admonishment uh, pre, pre-salvo commentary before, don't do exactly what is here. <laughs> Cause I just say it over and over and over again. So, so, so we all do this. So, you know, how, how, how does, how does one learn the piano? One learns the piano by playing music other people have written and you do that for a while and then you're like, okay, now I can, I can do this or, you know, there's an entirely different chord progression here. Or, you know, one of my uh, favorite stories, my favorite music stories, I think I, you and I have talked about this before, but um, in the Bitches Brew sessions in, in New York in the 60s, um, uh, there, there were three albums in a row that, that they basically recorded and they were entirely improv. They just got together and just shot through. It was like three days, three albums. And um, in one of the tracks on, 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 on Bitches Brew, uh, Herbie Hancock's playing and he screws something up. 
and he screws something up and he takes his hands off the keyboard and he kind of does this <laughs> and miles is next to him and miles plays his his screw up and then he plays it again and then he plays a variation on it and then he plays a variation on it and then he brings it right back into the song and when herbie tells that story he's like i realized at that point that there were no mistakes and once we get people to the point where they have built a system that allows, so that system at that point became literally the system that was created by um, the band. The band gave Herbie Hancock the permission Right. to make that mistake and then recover and the support i mean there's basically like yeah. so if people aren't familiar with this is basic framework which is kind of the, the charts they're using for the structure of the song there's specific patterns that people go through like who's going to solo when but that whole thing miles davis says about jazz being social music i mean that's exactly a perfect example of communication and respect because he hears the thing he might know it's wrong but he's gonna hold him and make it right by riffing on it and playing it back and making it part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And often what happens is when you're working as an individual and you've been given a complex piece of work and you can't get it done right, it becomes an existential threat because you don't have Miles Davis sitting over your shoulder going, oh, hey, look, complexity. I'm going to rip off, riff off of that complexity. So what should happen is you get a, a task, you're looking at it, you're working on it, you discover weird stuff in it. You should treat that as an opportunity for not you, just you, but the entire team to learn something and to build something probably unique. Because if you find something in your code yeah. that is complex and you solve it, it's likely that other teams in your competition weren't able to solve that same problem. Okay. And so we, when we build our schedules out with our little Gantt charts, we build them out in a way that rewards ignoring that complexity, underplaying it, and then turning it into a screw up. And so holding Herbie happened, Hancock accountable. You would have held Herbie Hancock <laughs> accountable. You would, have ended the, you would have ended the take. You would have said, dude, God damn it, play the keyboard. <laughs> then, you know, next time he'd be thinking about, you know, that, or there wouldn't be a next time because it's all improv. They would have lost the value that they'd created. Or they would have done the exact same thing over again and it's, it loses its verb. Organicness. Yeah. 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 It, it loses that bit that made it such an incredible track. That was, I think it was Miles Does the Voodoo, Voodoo Down, I think was the, the track that was, uh, that was, that was on. Um, uh, just the, the, one of the best teams that I worked with was a team of a bunch of young, crazy Bavarian guys in the southernmost recent regions of Germany, like where Germany can't figure out whether it's Austria or Italy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, they had a tiny office with a circular, a giant circular desk. And then the entire room was, was surrounded by whiteboards and all day long, they typed and talked to each other. They talked nonstop. And so they were just constantly group processing the work that they were doing. Okay. And, uh, and they were doing something that was really complicated. Uh, they were making a, uh, system where thousands of people could come together and edit the same InDesign document at the same time to do like global localization for advertising. Okay. Uh, and it, it was, it was an amazingly complex piece of software that they built in a very beautiful way. It was, it was a really nice piece of equipment. Um, but they did that entirely because they were able to just sit there and process, process together. Okay. So I can see where somebody like, I mean, I'm looking at the five lenses here, listening to what mm -hmm. you're saying and thinking about a team mobbing or just sitting around a circular table, communicating all day long. Mm -hmm. And I can totally hear somebody like me saying, yeah, but how am I going to get flow? If people are talking at me all day long, I need to be by myself. <laughs> so my brain can do what it That's does. Right. How can I, how can I, how can I play the piano with all this music going on? <laughs> 
but but there's i mean there is people need the yeah. reflective kind of yeah. solo time say, process yeah. uh, so again I'm not saying everybody immediately go out and get a circular desk. And I, like, I don't want all of a standing sudden, you know, circular Her, desk. Herman Miller to have the standing <laughs> circular desks that everybody pushes around to be with the other people they want to work with. Um, but what I am saying is that for that group, they figured out a way to get their personal optimization okay. of the information that they needed in order to do a, a good job. Uh, so when we come back and we look at these, these things, we, I don't want people going, wow, or, you know, cause, cause then you're going to go all new age. Like, are we really communicating? <laughs> you know, uh, it's going to be, so then the sixth lens is going to be patchouli, yeah, patchouli oil or something. <laughs> Some uh, dancing so, bears. <laughs> so what we want is we want to make sure that the, the system that we're building is practical. Okay. So when we when you and I get together on this call and you say I want to talk about the the lenses, we're going to have a conversation about the theoretical side of this because this is the theoretical side of this. Yeah. The, what this translates into is oh, as a professional, you need this kind of information. You need to provide this kind of information. The project requires this kind of information. In order to respect each other, we need to make sure that this information is available. We do that by building a physical, practical, real life obeya or, okay. or virtual. Um, but we build a system that says, I know as a professional where to go to get the information I need to get my work done. Unbelievably practical undeniably practical <laughs> okay. application of this. But if we don't ask these questions, we won't have the right information on the walls okay. or the virtual walls. <laughs> uh, and I've never seen the same project have the same visualizations. And I've never seen the same project have the same visualizations up for more than a month or two. So it doesn't take to change everything every other month, but it means that, that, that you're going to put up visualizations that are relevant for the work you're doing right now. And then they're going to go away when that work isn't relevant anymore. Okay. So uh, building the Coney Island hospital, there were tons of visualizations up for putting in the pilings, but when you're up working on the fourth or fifth floor, you don't have to worry about the pilings anymore. So those yeah. go away and they're replaced by something else. Okay. Um, but, but we have to see it. We have to understand it as a group and we have to be expected as professionals to help when we can. Okay. I want to, I don't know if this is going to work. I'm going to try to ask you some questions about this. It's something you just said okay. about how every team is going to have a different version of this. Mm -hmm. Up until that point, I was thinking I wanted to ask questions about my own personal use of it, but then it switched over to something else. So <laughs> uh, I'm going to do the individual part first and then, present the other scenario awesome when i think of what, what's happened for me with these lenses is i start out with like communication do i communicate yeah i communicate how do i do it well i send them an email i do this i do that that's mm -hmm. like the bare standard that i learned as a project manager like did i fill out the communication i create a communication plan do we all know how we're interacting but then i am at this level of questioning for each one of these things where I'm like well yeah i'm doing it but Really though, am I, am, am I, is it working? <laughs> and so there's this like devil's advocate voice in the back of my head, questioning the depth of the communication, the quality of the message. Like, is it being received? Am I honoring the other person and being respectful? Am I fostering a better relationship? Um, and it's more about different love, different kinds of flow. Like you mentioned that, you know, the, mm -hmm. the cognitive flow too, but that's all going on in my head at a personal level. Everything I could see like at a company level was great until you said, and every team's going to do it differently. And I just, in my head, like all the people that are listening to this, that work in a PMO were like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Cause they can't, yeah. if their job is to support this, what they would say, here are the communication artifacts you create, but you're, how would they help a team or help a system create a system that would allow for that deeper engagement. Uh, okay, so every every professional football team has an offensive coordinator, and that offensive coordinator comes up with all these different ways for people to run around with a football and try and get past other people who want to cause them bodily harm. Sure. 
um, they all adhere to the general rules of football. The plays can be quite different. Okay. okay. <laughs> so what these aren't going to be is you're never going to walk in probably and, and see that like everything is all of the visualizations are in felt and that, and the, <laughs> you know, <laughs> black light felt though, right? That's right. That's right. You know, the, the, the lava lamps and everything. Uh, so you're probably, you're not probably not going to have like the, the, uh, the acid trip obeya. Um, <laughs> but, but what you are going to have, and it's so like I said, I, I have never seen a successful obeya that doesn't have a Kanban in it, regardless of vertical. Okay. Whether you're making refrigerators, whether you're sending people to the moon, the, the, there are elements of the workflow that are linear and need to be tracked as such. It's hands down. And if you don't have that, then you'll be creating complexity with whatever, whatever sure. other visualizations you're using. Having said that, there are unique problems that need to be solved. And those unique problems tend to have unique visualizations. Okay. Now, all of those visualizations are probably going to show state. They are going to have triggers for action. Okay. They are going to show direction, which is basically your plan. Uh, they are going to show narrative, which is as you've gone along, how have you right. adhered or deviated from your plan? What did okay. you learn as you went along that made this a smarter project than when you started? They will show culture or underwrite culture or promote culture because of their very nature and their, their own their, culture. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, so the teams, the team's culture, uh, they will, they will foster professionalism because they're helping people get the information they need and to know when they can help others, even when it's outside of their job definition. <laughs> so they have a certain role definition. Other people are having a problem and it's a big one. They say, you know what? I can put my stuff on hold for a couple of days and come out and help you out because I don't maybe understand your whole domain, but I do understand how I can help. Okay. Um, and then the last one is identity. So the more of those boards that go up, the more you understand what's happening in the entire project and how and why and with who. And okay. then your identity of your role in the project, your place in the project grows. Um, okay. so those, and it those, becomes more normalized that you're looking at things this way too, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So that, then that's, that's, that's part of the culture is part of the identity. Okay. Um, is, is that you, not only you, but those who are impacted come in and start using, using that obey. Okay. So these, the, the humane management part is, have we built an environment that is conducive to professionals being able to do professional work. Okay. And the other thing that I talked about, which were the elements of visual management, those are the ways that you take that right environment that you've created and build uh, a practical management system from it. Okay. So, so the reason that this would be difficult to grok on its own is because it was never meant to operate on its own. Okay. So it's part of a bigger system. Yeah. Um, when, as I am learning about these things and as I am work, I feel like I'm developing, I'm still pretty ham-fisted with it, but a better ability to wield some of these tools or use these tools for good. I still find myself having a really instant kind of reflective reaction against it. A good example would be, so in, in the course that I'm taking, I'm on a team with other people. Mm -hmm. And when we first started, we, we had a time where we set up conversations about like, how do we want to communicate? How are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? And there's a really big part of me who's like, oh my God, can we not just do some freaking work? Like, why do we <laughs> have to spend all the time talking about stuff? Um, <laughs> but afterwards, I realized how important it was to have those conversations. And I'm, I'm just wondering, like, for you and Tony Ann, are you at a point where, like, you don't even have that voice anymore? Or does it still kick in? And if it does, how do you tell it to go sit in the corner and wait? Oh, it kicks in every day. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, so, I, I, you know, we have our courses on Modus Institute. I'm writing a book. Tony's preparing to write a book. She's she's preparing to move again for like the second time in six months. Um, we have uh, marketing things going on. We have client work going on. There's a lot of noise. Yeah. 
and uh, our clients are in also a pandemic. Uh, yeah, and a pandemic. So there's a lot of uh, yeah, a pandemic and an unnecessary war. Uh, so our our developers, half of them were in Belarus and half of them wow. were in Ukraine. Okay. So they suddenly were at war with each other, where they used to like literally wake up in the morning and say, "Hey, let's just drive over and get coffee." <laughs> and now they're like, "Hey, let's drive to Poland." <laughs> you know. Uh, so um, I. Um, yeah, the, the world uh, provides a lot of stress. And when the world puts stress on you, your tolerance for not immediately seeing results shrivels up. It, it is a raisin in the sun. <laughs> uh, and um, so, and, and it will, it will, it will either shrivel up or, you know, what actually ends up happening is kind of like like nuclear raisin in the sun so it shrivels up to a point where its mass gets so tight that it explodes so it both shrivels up like a raisin in the sun and it explodes uh and we see that every day where people are like going through planning and then one of them priors out and says why aren't we working <laughs> big things now yeah <laughs> <laughs> so so um uh in our own ways you know tony ann and i both uh, have have the, have break levers and will slow processes down because it's not going in the in the direction that we would like to see it in, and in both cases the other person reacts negatively to that. Okay. Why are you stopping me? I was almost done. Blah 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 blah. In every case, the product is improved by the slowing down. The other person being the break person. That doesn't make you thrilled to see the brake light go on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, especially when you are kind of simultaneously in a space where you have some psychological flow mm -hmm. and you know that on your Kanban, there are 10 things in your backlog that need to be pulled by the end of the day. And you're like, I'm dead, dead. I'm getting it, I'm getting it, brake light. No. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that is the that is the PG way of putting it. <laughs> it's uh it's uh, there there was a, at one point uh at the beginning of the pandemic uh this this particular room that I'm sitting in is at the top of a four-story house. And so it becomes very hot up here in the summer. So I have windows all around me, so I have them all open. And at one point my wife comes up and says, I just want you to let you know that the neighborhood is filled with kids and they can all hear you. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I had to go through my own PGification of, of my own face uh, as, as, as we went forward. Uh, well, so you just teach them how to curse properly. I mean, where's the harm in that? Right. That's right. I'm going to put some New York and you Seattle kids. <laughs> <laughs> Got to bring the passive aggressive up to the front. That's exactly right. Uh, so, so yeah, it's um, the, we're never going to stop being people. Okay. Uh, so that's all more the reason why we need the obeya, because the obeya then is the thing that brings the message, not the gym or the Tony Ann. Because okay. I can really easily be pissed off at a Tony Ann. It's very hard for me to be pissed off at an inanimate object. Okay. You know, yeah. Uh, you know, unless it's an Xbox. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, or from time to time, uh, digital music software. Yes. Um, uh, it's like you, you need to update in the middle of this. <laughs> I'm recording actively. There was no reason for you to update right now. Um, so, so yeah, that that that's a thing. Okay. Human humans are a thing, and it's 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 all part of that. Is have we built a system that allows us to you know psychological safety is a thing right now because no systems allow for inf for information for deviations to be elegantly discovered without human intervention. Okay. So imagine if those deviations are just obvious because they just show up on your visual control, you know. And you can't, and, you, and then you have to decide, I'm going to 
continue to pretend that that's not there or I'm going to actually do something about it. Yeah. It's the little, the little gas light on your car. Yeah. Yeah. You just turn the radio up. It gets better. That's um, right. <laughs> okay. So I want to, um, there's two things that I wanted to share that I've picked up from the course. And then maybe you can talk a little bit about the, the program and how it works. Sure. That'd be okay. So for the, for folks that are listening, I mean, as somebody who's in the course, I'm obviously kind of biased in favor of it, but um, these lenses have been a really important, become a really important set of tools for me. And there's something that the more I use them, the, the deeper my understanding of them gets. I did want to share two things that I've taken away from the course so far that have sort of changed the way that I think about work, the way that I interact with work. Um, when, when Jim and Tony Ann talk about people being professionals, um, my brain now translates that into people that thrive at work because professional meant show up, wear pants and do your job. But this is way more than that. And, and that like that changing in the way I understand the shape of work is a really big part of this. The other thing that was a, um, a bit I was watching the other day where the question was asked, like, when was the last time you finished something and felt proud of the work you've done? I was like, well, I, it's done when I don't care about it anymore. Like when I just like, pff, whatever, like I just can't be bothered anymore. Then I know I'm done. But thinking about that, like if everything that I did all day long was something that I was able to engage with in a way that left me feeling positive about it when it was done, like that's a very different life mm -hmm. than most people have. And so that for, I think it's good, it's probably good and bad. It changes the, it's changed the way I look at everything that I'm doing. But um, I don't know, that would be sort of my pitch for folks who are who are curious about it. But now, how would you describe the whole program to somebody? Um, well, the, the first thing that I'll just note about, about the word professionalism is when I was a young uh, urban planner and transportation engineer, I had the incredibly good fortune to go work for a company called David Evans and Associates. And uh, it was when I went there, it was a small company, had about 100 people in it. When I left, it had a lot more. We, we grew tremendously while I was there, but it was owned by David Evans, not surprisingly. And one of the first things that he and the people who founded the company said that they wanted was they wanted a company where they could hire outstanding professionals and give them the tools that they needed to do an outstanding job. And that was our slogan, our tagline, but the company lived it. We were always looking for ways to learn. We were always looking for ways to help each other. We were always looking for ways to collaborate. So we found the outstanding professionals, not a bunch of outstanding professional. Right. <laughs> With minions. Uh, and gave them, uh, as, as a group, the tools that they needed to do an outstanding job. And um, it was a, it was, it was a, leaving that company was one of the most difficult things I ever did. Uh, I adored that company. I adored the people that I worked with. And um, I've always taken that with me. Uh, we, we, we were very proud of the work that we did. And our reputation as a company wide was uh, one of just uh, relentless quality. Um, and so what I see in software, especially is it's not just like put on your pants and do a good job, but it's get the work done as fast as possible. But the cheapest talk about, tools they can get for you. Yeah. Talk about your, talk about your velocity or your throughput or your cycle time or, or whatever, N you know, brush your defect rate under the, under the rug. <laughs> um, uh, all, all productivity all the time, not lines of code, especially what a horrible metric lines of code is. Um, so what, what we want from professionals is we want Herbie Hancock. We want that 80 year old person who is the best keyboard player in the history of keyboard players who still practices every day. And who still has a, an amazing attitude about the profession that he's in. Uh, 
I, I went to, he's, he's like, uh, I have now seen two concerts during COVID. One was last week, so it doesn't count. Uh, but he was the only one that I was like willing to like risk my life <laughs> to go see. Uh, and it was nearly a religious experience just because of his relationship to his profession. How he cared for himself while he was playing and how he cared for his bandmates when he was playing, how he cared for the audience. Um, so in the Lean Agile Visual Management Program, uh, it's a long program. So you've been like, what, six months so far? Yeah. <laughs> so this isn't a two, two day sit and get thing, but it's, we wanted to ask what, what do we want? What do we want to get out of, out of this program? Okay. By offering it. And so that sounds kind of self-centered, but we wanted to make sure that we were going to have a product that in the end made all professions better. Okay. Yes, software development, but whomever chose, chose to come. So we have people in the program from all sorts of different professions. Um, what we study is this. Anyone can teach you how to build workflow. It's right. not hard. You do a value stream map. You figure out how your work flows. You toss some, pick things up on a Kanban and you're done. Go watch some YouTube videos if that's what you're interested in. <laughs> um, you know, we offer that for free. There's, you know, the Modus Institute site will have that for free. Um, what we study is how do you actually build a system in which, as Dave just said, people can thrive. That when they come to work, they're making the best decisions. They're glad to be there, even if it sucks that day. Uh, they understand the people they're working with, the product they're building and stuff, sure. But they also understand that, that bad things happen. So in my career, uh, we have had to deal with colleagues dying. We have had to deal with colleagues being incarcerated for doing really, really bad things. <laughs> okay. Like, like, like difficult to describe how bad we, we've had to deal with uh, discrimination lawsuits. This isn't, this isn't Modus Institute I'm talking about, by the way, <laughs> but this is like just all of the customers, all the clients that we've had to deal yeah. with that, that when you become a manager People seem to think that, that you, you, you work along the management path by being like a good coder and then you become a manager, which means like super coder. Well, you're not. When you're a manager, you're dealing with the fact that these two people hate each other or that these two stakeholders want to, to, to rip your team in half and, and dedicate them to other projects right. or you, you, crazy stuff happens in life. This is a class to help solve crazy stuff by building systems for your teams that have so much coherence in them that you have the bandwidth to deal with the crazy. So there's two parts of that. There's one, how do we build that coherent system? And two, when crazy arrives from the lightly crazy, which is I'm not sure how to do this task, to the high crazy, which is someone just bought, sh brought sh shotguns to the office. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you how do you have the bandwidth to deal with those things in a calm, collected, professional way? Okay, um, that's what this class is about, and uh, I've loved every second of it. <laughs> but when you come, expect this class to be like a master's degree. Don't expect it to be like a CSM. I would agree. And I teach CSM and it's much harder. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I love this stuff. I love, uh, obviously I love working with you, but I love working with, um, uh, with clients and just helping people deal with the real complexity of modern business and get rid of the manufactured complexity that we create every day by just having really poorly designed systems of work. Cool. And where That's can they it. learn more about this? 
They can learn more about this at modusinstitute.com. That's modusinstitute.com. Uh, uh, keyword Modus Institute. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when you get there, uh, you will find uh, more than likely uh, that there is a, a coupon code at the top of the screen. Uh, the current co current one is 20. Uh, the word 20 uh, is 20% off. I think everything that's up on the site. Um, and um, so, or you can chat with us uh, and, uh, and, and, and we will, we will talk. There's usually someone around, uh, but if we're not around, it's because we're buried in something just like everyone else. Um, the other thing of course, always is that the, the personal Kanban book does live. Uh, so if you've not thought, thought about any of this stuff before, that might not be a bad place to start. Yeah. Um, that's where you can find, oh, and also if you just want to talk like you're, I don't know, if you're bored or lonely, <laughs> there is the chat feature on all of our websites. Again, just, just ping us and someone, someone will be there to give you a hug. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much for doing this. And I really appreciate all the work that you do on behalf of me and everybody else who's now thinking about this stuff differently. I, I appreciate that. This was a fun conversation. So thank you. It was fun.